wanted to analyze each point, each point as referenced by the light cone frame. So to me, as an engineer, I said, if you have these projections, these surfaces in time, these are hypersurfaces in time, they have surface tension. So all I did was use what I knew as a physical chemist slash engineer elastician, said, I want to see how this little projection of space time moves with proper time. So I applied the mechanics of infinitesimal strain theory to this little element, which has some pressure P, which happens to correlate to mass, energy, and it has surface tension pulling on all sides because of the laws of physical chemistry. It has to be equal to P, the energy in it. And I wrote down the stress energy tensor for this. I'm going to show it to you here in tensor form. I think in my first paper, a lot of people I've showed it to didn't understand that the equations I, were writing, I was writing were components of tensors. So to make that point today, I just I want to show it, because I know most of you don't have a background in mathematics of elasticity. I'm trying to show you how similar it is to general relativity and to Riemann uh, type calculations. So this is my stress energy tensor for this type of element. You can see it has P here, the time time term. It has kappa. By the way, this little Greek symbol is called kappa. That's what I'm using to represent surface tension in all directions. And why is it diagonal? Because I'm in the light cone frame. I boosted myself up to this, uh, what us engineers call the principal frame. By the way, one of the hard parts for me is all the different terminology. I don't know if, uh, I think anybody is a mathematician, um, a physicist, but mathematicians call the principal frame the tangent bundle, a section of the tangent bundle. Physicists call it Gaussian or Riemann coordinates, and us engineers call it the principal frame. By the way, we solve problems in the principal reference frame all the time in mechanics because it's the easiest to do algebra. You can do Newtonian uh, physics in the principal frame because everything is in Cartesian coordinates and uh, you're back in uh, a space that has just a three plus one separation, right? <clears throat> anyway, the next thing I did was write the equations of motion for that little sliver of hypersurface using Newtonian mechanics. And you get a time term that looks like this, and then all the rest of these terms, I'm not going to go through it because you can read my first paper. You get this third tensor that is has to do with how surface tension changes in time, like the changing of temperature of the whole universe, okay? <clears throat> Equations of motion have uh, uh, essentially the derivative of these stresses with space equated to the energy, which might you might call the Hamiltonian of this location, divided by the speed of light squared times uh, the stretching, excuse me, the acceleration of this of this little uh, element in, in space time, the four vector acceleration. Then I wrote the rate of deformation tensor. I'm sorry, it's hard to see. I realized this screen was going to be quite so uh, dim, but we'll go quickly. The rate of deformation tensor is a two, uh, has a two components, one in the observer's time, one in the particle's time, or the infinitesimal element. So I think it's called the two vector. And what I'm relating is the location, or how the element evolves in time, in proper time, to some original metric, which in this case I showed as flat, but you can put in the original metric from any nearby point. Okay, and then the last thing you do as an elastician is you have to come up with a constitutive equation, which in my first paper I said that uh, stress energy equals Planck's constant over two times the rate of deformation tensor. The rate of deformation tensor is kind of how things stretch, right? By doing this, I got an alternative of quantum mechanics in geometry. This top equation was how the element is moving in the time-time direction. 
you get a klein coordinate type equation where the thing that is moving is actually the coordinate of time in the light cone frame. So you remember how I had that wavy surface? Those waves, which would be considered capillary waves to me, are just moving along you know, the curvature of space-time, ordinary curvature. These are capillary waves, which happen to take the appearance of a klein gordon equation. The next equation you get, which kind of looks like Schrodinger, is by solving the equations of motion of this little element of space-time moving in, you know, in a spatial direction. You get exactly the Schrodinger type uh, non-relativistic -relativist, equation because we're working in the light cone frame. Even the I pops up because you have, uh, oh, oh, by the way, I don't have a probability wave. I have a real wave of contractions in space, which are also stresses and mass. Mass moving through space-time moves according to a Schrodinger-like equation in this model. Massless particles move according to the klein ward equation in the time direction because they don't, those types of waves don't move any stress or, or mass. But this other type of wave moves mass or stress in this, in this model. The last one, or the next one is the wild type equation go back and look at some of these equations again. So this rate of deformation tensor is how this metric is evolving, if you will, how space-time is evolving. The off-diagonal terms have something that has to do with the stretchiness and something that has to do with the curviness of this infinitesimal element. And if we go back to the stress tensor, okay, we have zero in these terms in the principal reference frame. So that means, according to the constitutive relationship, the stress, the strain terms, the rate of deformation terms, have to equal zero for the off-diagonals. That gives you the equation of a vortex if you are in real physical space. These vortices are governed by a wild-type equation. You can have different quantized type, types of vortices. Anyway, lastly, you get the Heisenberg, something similar to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, just from the constitutive relationship itself. If we go back to this, you have stress energy. So this is basically energy. This is the rate of deformation, which has units of one over time. So move time over here, you get energy times time is this. Okay? So now how does gravity fit in? All this is from my paper from last year. I just put it in tensor form so you can see that I was doing tensor calculus in, in that paper. How does gravity fit in? Oh, I'm pressing the pushing. Okay, let's go back to the rate of deformation tensor, but I'm gonna write it a different way so that you can see. So if you picked up any book on elasticity, mathematics elasticity, you'd see the rate of deformation tensor has this form. In fact, this other half isn't shown. This is just the normal uh, you know, strain tensor. You look it up in Wikipedia. What I've added is the membrane part, which you have to grab a book on shell theory for this part. So this whole deformation tensor, which is how space-time evolves in proper time in the light cone frame, has a stretchy term, which has to do with how the volume changes of space-time, and it has a curvature term. Has to do with how curvy it is. So when I first came up with this last year, I was, or two years ago, I was thinking, gosh, this sounds like Einstein's tensor. It's got a part that is has to do with the change of volume. It has a part that has to do with the curviness. But I didn't want to come out and say it because I had no way of proving that this had anything to do with the Einstein tensor. So for two years, I've been researching this, and this is what I've come up with. Okay. First of all, let's notice that these terms, I know they're hard to see, this says the partial derivative of the time component, so that that's where its position is in the light cone frame, with respect to space, squared, basically. That is the Gaussian curvature in three dimensions. So we're, we're in this three plus one space, this term here is the Gaussian curvature. How many people know what the Gaussian curvature is when you go from 3D to 4D? 
the intrinsic Gaussian curvature is the Ricci scalar. <coughs> you can look that up on uh, Wikipedia if you want. Okay? This first term here is, uh, it's actually, I had it wrong in my original paper, I misquoted. You can grab the book on mathematics elasticity by Gerald Marsden. This is the push forward of the lie derivative of the metric. Okay, I want to find this rated deformation tensor with two covariant components so that I can have it in the right format. So what I do is I multiply through by, sorry you can't see that, that is the metric G with two covariant components. So what it's going to do is it's going to transform this to rated deformation with two covariant components. It's going to change this push forward to the identity matrix and then you're left with only the lie derivative of the metric. If you grab a paper by Werner Israel from 1968, or you look on page 450 of the, of the textbook by uh, Kip Thorne on gravity, he talks about in three plus one space, the lie derivative of the metric is, I thought I had another pop up here, the three dimensional ex extrinsic curvature. So we have the three dimensional extrinsic curvature and the Gaussian curvature, which are the Einstein tensor. So how this space-time is evolving in proper time in the light cone frame, when you apply mechanics elasticity to it, gives you the Einstein tensor. Okay, but now I'm in trouble, because I said that my uh, stress energy tensor was equal to Planck's constant times the Einstein tensor. If this is true, it's going to give me gravity that is 70, 67 orders of magnitude higher than we experience right now, right? So, so something's goofy. But all I needed for quantum mechanics was that the spatial terms had to have this constant. So in materials engineering, there are lots of materials. By the way, this constant term here that Einstein used in this equation, that is for an isotropic homogeneous material medium. So space time was isotropic homogeneous, you would have one constant there. But in material science, we have lots of exotic materials that are anisotropic. So I said, why can't the constant in Einstein's equation be anisotropic tensor that is orthonormal? Why does it have to be orthonormal? Because we have to have frame indifference. In engineering, we call that constant volume. We can't have the the, the shape changing volume depending on how we're looking at it. That doesn't make any sense. In physics, that's called frame indifference. Also by being orthonormal, it means that whatever I put in the time time term for mass, when I do my rotations, they'll always be multiplied by gravitational constant. And whatever I put in the spatial terms when you do your transformations will always be multiplied by Planck's constant. So how do I find the orthonormal <coughs> Uh, tensor that will fit into this equation. This took me like a year because I'm not a very good mathematician. And maybe you guys are looking at this going, oh, this is on page something of a book you read. I don't know, but I came up with this. In order, in order to be orthonormal, the determinant has to be equal to one. So a pretty easy thing, and this took me a while to come up with, but if you have b cubed here, over one over b, one over b, one over b, the determinant of this is always one, right? And you can multiply that by a constant. So now all I had to do was some very simple algebra by taking this constant times b has to give me Planck's constant here. This constant times b cubed has to give me the inverse of the Einstein uh, constant because Einstein had his constant over here on this side, right? All right, so when you plug all this in and you solve for the b's, you get a very sexy orthonormal matrix that looks like this. You have c times Planck's constant over 2 times 1 over 4 pi times the Planck length squared with 1, 1, 1. I know it doesn't look like uh, the uh, determinant of this is 1 because I kind of did some algebra, but if you take the determinant of this, you get that times that, which is Einstein's constant. Trust. So this is an orthonormal matrix. So all I'm saying in my theory, if you want to just boil it all down, I did all this math 
is that if you just plug in here for the, for the uh, if, you, if, you, if you agree with my premises of physical chemistry, that the stress energy tensor is not just P, but it has three negative terms in the stress energy portions. Remember that, that, that tensor? And then you plug in this anisotropic uh, elasticity tensor, we can get quantum mechanics and gravity to live together. So what did Howard just do? This is for the mathematic mathematician trying to put it more in anybody who has a mathematical frame mind of uh, manifolds. I'm saying that a manifold of an observer H for Howie and T for everybody else this is a T manifold. So th this guy is in coordinates X. This person is in coordinates Y. You have a regular mapping y equals some function of x from here to here. What we do in mathematics elasticity is we boost up to the principal reference frame at these locations. That's given by the transformation pi. Then the relationship between these two uh, boosted reference frames is given by f, which is the deformation gradient. So a really smart guy named Cauchy in 1860-something, which was predecessor to Gauss and Riemann, said that this, if you go here and you come back, that gives you the Cauchy stress tens strain tensor, which is the uh, deformation gradient transposed times the deformation gradient. And you can switch this around and go from here to back. Here. This Cauchy strain tensor gives you kind of, it's kind of like integrating your own loop and coming back. If you, and then this crazy guy named Lagrange said, we can take that tensor and we can set it equal to the identity matrix minus some small distance. So this is very much like G, in fact it is G. This is my metric. It is the identity matrix minus two times the rate of deformation tensor. These are all two-point tensors, or is that what you call two-point vectors? So they relate this space to this space. These tangent spaces, I should say. Because they're tangent spaces, they're Cartesian, and you can do Newtonian mechanics to relate them, which is all I did in elasticity. So I'm going to try to get my paper on my website by next week for you guys if you want to look at it.